Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this class on theories of war and peace. A distant class, no more face-to-face -face classes due to the COVID crisis, you know that, so I record all the lectures. Put them on YouTube and you will have uh, the possibility to listen to them and to look at them as often as you want to beginning with the scheduled slot, that is to say Wednesday afternoon at 3.45 p.m. Some preliminary, even personal remarks before going into the details of today's introduction. The class on theories of war and peace, I created it uh, 20 years ago. For the then students, of course, and I taught it during 10 years, roughly. And then I decided to abandon it for two reasons. A general one, first of all, teachers should renew their lectures regularly. In order not to get bored themselves, of course, and in order not to bore their students. But there was also a more specific um, reason. The feedback of a student who substantively made the following remark. What is the use, he said, what is the use of such a class on war and peace, on theories of war and peace, since there are no more wars nowadays? Uh, the remark um, surprised me, it uh, disappointed me. And so I had two reasons to abandon this class. Ten years later, that is to say now, nowadays, um, I decided to give this class again. I decided to revisit this course for one reason, a general reason, once again. I have to renew my classes. And um, since I'm getting old, I'm no longer sure I'm able to invent completely new lectures. So I revisit existing ones more seriously, of course. I was influenced by an analysis put forward by a French general, summed up in uh, the French newspaper Le Monde. Um, less than three months ago, on June 17, 2020. His name is uh, General Thierry Burkhard. He gave me uh, the substantive reason to revisit this class and to deepen once again the topic on theories of war and peace. What he said, indeed, proved that my students, the critical one, actually was wrong, which amounts to saying that I was right, or at least I am right to give this class again. So this is what he said, this is what he put forward as an argument. First of all, according to this general of the French army, the, the land forces. The cycle of conflicts, he said, characterized by counterinsurgency. What we call asymmetric conflicts. The cycle of these conflicts fought by France and Western powers in general. Since World War II, in French in the China, in Vietnam regarding the US, in Afghanistan regarding uh, first the USSR, and nowadays the US in Iraq, in Africa too, in Syria. The cycle of these conflicts is coming to an end. This is what he says. And if it comes to an end, it's because new conflicts are likely to emerge in a far away, more or less far away future. Symmetric ones, I quote, opposing states to states. Why? Because Europe is surrounded by a growing militarization of the world. And he, of course, alludes to Russia and to Turkey, 
Russia intervening in its near broad Georgia, Ukraine, and also intervening in Syria, and Turkey intervening in Syria too, as well as in Libya for some weeks or months now. And there is a risk, therefore, given that there are also special forces from the US, from France, from the UK intervening in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, there is a risk of armed confrontations between the states, between major powers. He could have added the rise of China's military force, but he does not mention it. Anyway, so the claim that new confrontations are likely to emerge refutes the optimism that prevailed when the Cold War came to an end. Given that the Cold War came to a peaceful end that absolutely nobody had predicted in the 1980s, I was a student in the 1980s and everybody expected a major war to break out from Soviet Union's expansionism. We expected as students, I was in Paris, we expected as students that the Soviet tanks would invade first Germany and then France. Nothing happened. The USSR collapsed and the Cold War came to a peaceful end. And therefore, around the end of the 80s, the very beginning of the 90s, many optimistic analyses were put forward by politicians, by experts, and even by academics. According to them, the world was committed in a kind of civilization process, a synonymous with the gradual disappearance of war as a normal instrument for states to obtain satisfaction on the international scene. I would like to quote Francis Fukuyama and his end of history thesis. Well known, of course, it claimed that democracy was the only political regime considered to be legitimate. And given that more and more states became democratic ones, these states would form a Pacific Union because democracies do not go to war against each other. This is the so-called democratic peace theory. We'll come back to it in another chapter. So no more war because of the gradual spread of democracy. Another American uh, scholar, not, no more an expert, but a scholar, John Muller, published a book, Retreat from Doomsday, with the very uh, significant subtitle, The Obsolescence of Major War. According to John Muller, the world is committed in what he calls a Hollandization process. We'll come back to his thesis too. Hollandization from Holland, that is to say the Dutch, the Netherlands, who after being a major power towards the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, decided to no longer practice power politics, decided to become an economic actor and no more a political or strategic power. You know, this is the third optimistic thesis that was put forward in 1988. You know the concept of soft power coined by Joseph Nye. According to Joseph Nye, soft power is nowadays because of the growing interdependence, the growing globalization, soft power is much more useful than hard power for states to get what they want on the international stage. And last but not least, George Bush, the father, George Herbert Bush, after Iraq invading Kuwait on August the 2nd, did say in his speech held on 9-11, 9-11-1990, this famous New World Order speech. And in this New World Order speech, he said that this New World Order was characterized by the triumph of law and cooperation among states, no more wars, in other words. So very optimistic. This optimism was refuted during the last 
almost immediately after they were uh, put forward by Fukuyama, by Muller, by Nye, by Bush father. During the last three decades, a lot of armed confrontations uh, arise, occurred. Two years after Iraq had come to an end with its war against Iran, this war lasted from 80 to 88. I already mentioned it when talking about George Herbert Bush. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait on August the 2nd, 1990. And thus began the second Gulf War, pretty often called the first Gulf War. Those who call it the first Gulf War forget the genuine first Gulf War opposing Iraq to Iran from 80 to 88. The Americans call it the first Gulf War, this one from 1991, because they, were, they got involved, of course. So they got involved because after Iraq invading Kuwait, America staged, thanks to a UN resolution, this is important, they staged the first Operation Desert Shield, that is to say they sent their troops to Saudi Arabia in the Saudi Arabian desert to prevent any prospective further attack of Saddam Hussein against Saudi Arabia. And this Operation Desert Shield was followed by Operation Desert Storm, the offensive uh, intervention of America with its allies, the British, the US, but some Arab states too, the, the UK, the French, uh, some Arab states too, in order to force uh, Saddam Hussein to withdraw his troops from Kuwait, thus permitting Kuwait to become again a sovereign state. During the 90s, twice did the North Atlantic Treaty Organization intervene in former Yugoslavia, 1995 in Bosnia, 1999 in uh, Kosovo. Never had the North Atlantic Treaty Organization intervened militarily from 49 when it was created to 1995 when it had to cope with the reason of its existence, that is to say, the Soviet Union. Twice did it uh, resort to violence during the 90s. And once again, in 2011, it intervened in Libya against Gaddafi after the French and the British had initiated a military operation to get rid of Gaddafi, or at least to prevent Gaddafi from killing a significant part of his own, of his own Libyan people. After the terrorist attacks of 9-11, George Bush, the son, George W. Bush launched Operation Enduring Freedom against Afghanistan in October 2001. And some one year and a half later, in March 2003, it is an indirect consequence of 9-11, of, um, uh, George, Bush, George Bush's administration initiated Operation Iraqi Freedom to get rid of Saddam Hussein. In Africa, Various armed conflicts emerged opposing Ethiopia to Eritrea. Eritrea um, became an independent country uh, thanks to a war of secession. It had been a former province of Ethiopia. And once it became independent, the two states uh, launched a war to, to, to change the border. A so-called first African world war started in the 1990s opposing first the Great Lakes states and then the whole uh, Central African states. First African World War because seven powers were involved directly. Another war broke out between Sudan and South Sudan once thousands, thousands Sudan became independent. On the Asian continent, a decades old war has been going on opposing since the end of the Cold War, opposing Pakistan to India with a limited but nevertheless uh, significant armed conflict, the Kargil War of 1999. And very recently, a dispute provoking the death of tens of soldiers opposed India to China at their common border in the Himalaya. In the Middle East, also another decades-old rivalry, regularly 
ends up in armed confrontation, the one opposing Israel to the Palestinians, in this case Hamas, but also to the Hezbollah in Lebanon. Russia intervened in its near abroad, 2008, against Georgia. And since 2014, at least indirectly, it is present in the eastern part of Ukraine to support the pro-Russian Ukrainian population. In the Donbas region, it also grasped. It seized uh, the Crimean Peninsula, which had been part of the Ukrainian territory. Russia also intervenes in Syria and, of course, in Syria and in Iraq to fight against ISIS and or to fight against uh, the regime of Assad. The Western powers intervene, the US, the British, the French, with special forces. Their armies, strictly defined, are not present, but special forces are present. So does Turkey. And Saudi Arabia, you may know that, intervenes militarily with bombing campaigns in Yemen. So many, many armed confrontations have been occurring since the very optimistic uh, predictions made by George Herbert Bush, by Fukuyama, by John Miller, by Joseph Nye. To some extent, the majority of the wars that I mentioned, all the more so the last ones, the Western interventions against ISIS, the Western interventions against the Taliban and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. From the Western point of view, to some extent, these armed conflicts can be considered as asymmetric conflicts. However, this is my point of view, whether they are considered as asymmetric or not from a purely academic point of view, the one that I adopt here, that I should adopt as a teacher, as a scholar. Be they asymmetric or not, from an academic point of view, they are walls. We'll come back to the definition in a few minutes, of course. They are walls, which amounts to saying that there were wars in the past, there were Wars. There have been wars nowadays during the last three decades. War, therefore, is a characteristic of international politics. And I would like to quote the German playwright of the first half of the 20th century. Maybe you know him, Bertolt Brecht is his name. He wrote a play called Mother Courage, Mother Courage and her children, Mutter Courage und Ihre Kinder auf Deutsch. It is probably his best known anti war play written in 1939 after Hitler invading Poland. It is a play which is set, which he sets in the period of the Thirty Years' War. And this is the quote which sums up what I said up to now War is like love, it always finds a way. I repeat, war is like love, it always finds a way. Always, in other words, do wars break out regularly? Why then does war or should war always find a way? This, to some extent, is the core question of this class on theories of war and peace. Why do wars regularly break out. Why, to quote a book recently published last year by the American bear Brow Miller, why do only the dead, and I go on showing you the whole quote of a Spanish-American philosopher, Santayana, why do only the dead see the end of wars? Only the dead see the end of war. In other words, why do wars persist even in the modern contemporary age? To ask this question is not that self-evident. Why? Because 
there are at least as many people who think that wars regularly break out as there are people claiming that peace is what people prefer. Listen, for instance, to the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. This is what he wrote more than two millennia ago. War, and he uses the Greek term polemos, war is the father of everything. The king of everything. During periods of war, some people become free men, whereas other ones are enslaved. War is the father of everything. I would like to quote to the Chinese philosopher Sun Tzu. In his Art of War, this is the title of his essay. The art of war is of vital importance to the state. It's a matter of life and death. A road either to safety or to ruin. And a third quote from a contemporary author, the French Rémoiron, in his Peace and War book, published in 1962 in French, translated in the US. War, he says, belongs to any civilization that occurs throughout history. War belongs to any civilization and occurs throughout history. So on the one hand, a lot of people agree in saying that wars, yes, do characterize international politics. But on the other hand, a lot of very smart people claim the opposite. Just listen to another Greek thinker, Herodotus, the first, to some extent, geographer, at least in the Western world. According to Herodotus, I quote, nobody is foolish enough to prefer war to peace. Nobody is foolish enough to prefer war to peace, because in times of peace, the children bury their fathers. Whereas in times of war, the fathers bury their children. And I would also like to quote St. Augustine, the very origin of Christian theological philosophy. This is what he wrote in the sixth century. There is nobody who does not like peace. And spontaneously, you and me, we all agree with this claim that everybody prefers peace to war. So then, if nobody is foolish enough to prefer war to peace, if everybody likes peace, why then do nevertheless wars regularly break out if you accept or agree with the analyses of the other? Of the thinkers that I mentioned. The purpose of this class, ladies and gentlemen, is to provide answers, or at least tentative answers, to the questions regarding the regularly outbreak of wars on the international scene. What are the causes of war? Are there reasons or conditions or possibilities for peace to prevail? Is it possible to quote John Lennon to give peace a chance? What are the causes of peace? What are the conditions? What are the causes of war? What are the conditions of peace according to the discipline of international relations, the academic disciplines of international relations? This is quickly summed up the objective of this class. The examples I give you. tend to show that the wars that we will have a look at are interstate wars, international wars, international wars, and not civil wars. The choice, of course, is debatable and therefore needs to be justified 
Let me try to explain why I will focus on international. First of all, to make this choice, to look at international wars, does not imply that I do consider civil wars to be less important than international wars, less important or less numerous. Of course not, of course not. Civil wars are nowadays and were in the past much more numerous than international wars. It is true during the, cold, during the, the post Cold War world, it's true during the Cold War, and probably, though the statistics are no longer that reliable, of course, probably it was true before. So civil wars are very recurrent. And they are also pretty destructive, of course, and politically significant. Just look at the American War of Secession, the Civil War of America in the 1860s. It caused the death of more Americans than any of America's international war of the 20th century, be it World War I, be it World War II, be it the Korean War, the Vietnam War, or America's interventions nowadays in Iraq and in Afghanistan. So yes, civil war provoked the death of a lot of people, and they are politically significant. Just look at the important civil wars. I forget the, the, the French Revolution. Just look at the civil wars of the 20th century, the Bolshevik Revolution at the origin of the Soviet civil war, the Spanish civil war, the Greek civil war after World War II, the Chinese civil war which lasted from the beginning of the 20s up to 49 when the communists prevailed the lebanese civil war from 75 to 90 the syrian civil war that started seven years ago in 2013 and is not completely over yet are politically at least for the countries concerned as significant as the international wars that the ussr that china fought during the 20th century so, let there be no mistake, I focus on international wars, but this does not mean that I consider civil wars to be not important, just I do not deal with them. Second remark, to focus on interstate wars rather than civil wars does not imply to claim there is no relation between the two. Of course, there are relationships between civil wars and international wars. Let me take the example of the Thirty Years' War, 1618-1648. It is the war which, by at least mainstream international relations scholars, is the war which is considered to be at the origin of the contemporary international system, interstate system, because it permitted the sovereignty principle to prevail over the imperial principle, thanks to France's victory the victory of France and its allies against the so-called Holy Roman Empire of German nation, ruled by Vienna, Austria at that time. This war, considered to be at the origin of the international system, started as a civil war, as a religious quarrel opposing the Catholic entities of the German Empire to the Protestant entity. The France, the French, the Dutch, the Swedish supported the Protestants against the Catholic entities, thus transforming an originally civil war into an international war. So there are links. The same is true for World War I. It's, it facilitated the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, which is at the origin of the civil war opposing the communists to those who did not want the communist regime in Soviet Union. Take the example of the Iranian revolution in 1978, which permitted the regime of the Ayatollahs to prevail against the Shah's regime. This civil war, because it provoked a civil war in Iran, the victory of the Ayatollahs provoked a civil war. This civil war, caused, at least indirectly, the war launched by Iraq against Iran, an international war, because Saddam Hussein at that time thought that 
Iran was weakened because of the civil war. So he thought that he might prevail easily when attacking Iran. He committed a mistake. The war lasted eight long years and it ended with a draw, no winner, no loser, and status quo regarding the territories. Last but not least, the majority of post Cold War wars fought military operations fought by Western powers are interventions in civil wars in other states. This was the case in Yugoslavia, it was the case in Iraq, it was the case in Libya. It still is the case in Iraq and Syria against the Islamic State. So there are links between civil wars and international wars. Civil wars as such are important and yet I think we should or at least I feel free to make the distinction between international and civil or intra-state wars. Why should we make this distinction? Well those who know me know the reason because of the bad rock assumption of international relations as an academic discipline, the bad rock assumption shared by mainstream scholars that is to say, realists, liberals, soft, at least soft constructivists, international politics takes place in an anarchical environment. International politics is anarchical and decentralized, I quote Kenneth Waltz, whereas domestic politics is hierarchical and centralized. International relations do take place in an anarchical environment. Anarchy, I quote Hadley Bull, can be regarded as the central fact of international life and can be and should be regarded as the, I quote, the starting point of theorizing about international life. Raymond shares exactly the same analysis. International politics is the only, the one and only social domain in which the resort to arms is recognized as legitimate. The resort to arms is not legitimate. Maybe with the, the exception of the US, the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which permits any individual to have his or her gun with the consequences that we know, that we see almost every day on our TV screens. Anyway, in the majority of states, a resort to arms is not legitimate because there is an overarching authority which, I quote Max Weber, possesses the monopoly of legitimate physical violence. There is no such monopoly on the international scene. There is no common government. There is no overarching authority recognized as such above the units. The units, be they states, or I would even say all the more so, be they non-states, non-states, non-state actors, terrorist networks, mainly the ones we will be interested in, of course, do not recognize any authority above them on the international scene. So an international war should be distinguished from a civil war. An international war is an armed conflict, I'll come back to this point, opposing political units that are independent, autonomous, separate from each other, be they state or not. And the civil war, an intra-state war, is an armed struggle within the boundaries of an entity which is recognized as sovereign, and it is an armed struggle which opposes protagonists belligerents which at the beginning, at the outset of the conflict, were, at least at the beginning, were subject to a common authority. Take the examples of the Yugoslavian wars, or the, or the, 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 sorry, the wars in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, they broke out when Yugoslavia collapsed. So to some extent they opposed independent entities because Croatia wanted to be independent, no longer wanted to be part of, of the former Yugoslavia, which is considered to be governed actually by Serbia. And the same was true for Slovenia, but no armed conflict emerged. The same was true for Bosnia. But since at the very beginning, the root of the conflict was 
did take place when Yugoslavia still was a single unit, a sovereign entity recognized as such at the United Nations, etc. It is considered to be a civil war. And this civil war became an international one when the NATO forces intervened against Milosevic to support the Bosnians, to support the people of Kosovo against the Serbians or the pro Serbians population in Bosnia and in Kosovo. So we will deal, ladies and gentlemen, in our lectures, in our 10-11 lectures, we will deal with international war. What then is an international war? We have to define, of course, a war and logically we have to define peace, since it is a class on theories of war and peace. Any scientific study, like any essay written by a student should start with defining the core concept. So let's define war and peace. And I do think that I have to start with the definition of war rather than the definition of peace. Why? Well, for a very simple reason, there are many more publications, essays on war than on peace. I would like to quote Jeffrey Blaney, if you have a look at the bibliography, I put his book, Causes of War, in the bibliography. It's one of the books I used, one of the books I used for this lecture, for these lectures. Listen to Jeffrey Blaney, page three. This is what he wrote. 4,000 pages dedicated to the study of war. 4,000 pages dedicated to the study of the causes of war. There is one page dedicated to the studies of the to the study of the causes of peace scholars are much more interested in analyzing why wars break out rather than trying to understand why peace sometimes or somewhere succeeds in prevailing so to some extent Scholars of international relations interested in studying war and peace are victims of what we may call a quantitative fallacy. Wars are very rare events. The probability for a war to break out in a given lapse of time among a within the diet of two randomly chosen states this possibility, this probability is close to zero. But the majority of scholars is interested in this possibility. Why? Because a war is an event, whereas a peace, peace, sorry, is a non-event. Nothing happens when peace prevails. A war has a beginning, it has an end most of the time. This is not the case for, for peace, since it is prevailing most of the time. Just as journalists, or we, citizens, citizen, are interested in the one plane that crashes, and not in the one hundreds and thousands of planes that take off and that land every day without any problem. So, international relations scholars are interested in the very rare wars that break out, rather than being interested in the overall peace which is prevailing. So this is the first reason why I will. This is the main reason actually why I start with the definition of war before coming to the definition of peace. What then is a war? The answer to this question is not that easy. It's not as easy as we might think spontaneously. Why? Well, because the, the, the term war is used in everyday language and not merely in social scientific analyses. This is the case for whatever social science concept. And this is a problem. This problem is what British uh, epistemologists calls 
the essentially contested nature of social science concepts, the essentially contested nature of social science concepts. In other words, to put it differently, there are as many definitions, respectively, there are prospectively as many definitions of a social science concept, now a case of war, as there are people using this term. And this is the case for any social science concept. There are many definitions of democracy. There are many definitions of uh, empire, imperialism, hegemony. Just take war. The term is used in everyday language. Trade war is a term used pretty often during the last three years because of the Chinese-American trade commercial rivalry. It is called trade war. We are talking of cyber war. We are talking of psychological warfare. We are talking of paper war, of wars of nerves, etc., etc. To avoid them, any risk of confusion, and this is the reason, I think, the main reason of academic, uh, of academic learning, of academic study. What justifies academic undertakings in the domain of social science is the fact that they try to rigorously analyze what is happening, to understand, to identify first, and to understand why the thing happened. And in order to do so, they use a rigorous concept, or should I say, they define rigorously the concept that they use. This doesn't mean that everybody agrees with this definition. This means that if you want to debate, if you want to commit yourself in a scientific controversy, you know what your opponents, the one with whom you disagree, you know what he, names war when using the term. So you can agree or disagree with him on the basis of his definition, or you can propose another definition. In this case, a scientific debate among equals is possible. This is hardly, or at least not always the case, when politicians clash, or when media, media, or when journalists, or when experts do disagree, because they want to impose their analysis upon their opponents. So which then, scientific or more modestly, which academic definition is existing in the discipline of international relations? Which definition of war? I would like to quote four authors that, who proposed fairly rigorous definition. The first one is the German or the Prussian, actually, strategic thinker Karl von Clausewitz. I guess you know him. He proposed in his On War essay written at the end of the 1820s or so. He died before finishing the book. It was published by his wife. He was a general in the Prussian army fighting against uh, Napoleon. He was not very successful on the battlefield. So he, practitioners who fail become theorists, ladies and gentlemen. I know what I'm talking about. No, I'm joking. But this is the case for Machiavelli too. Machiavelli was a diplomat. He wanted to be uh, also an advisor of the French, the, the, the French, of the Florentine uh, Lawrence, the magnificent Lawrence, Lorenzo de Medici. He failed, and so he wrote his prince, and he became very famous thanks to his prince. The same is true for Clausewitz, became famous not because of his victories on the battlefield, but thanks to his essay on war. And he gave two definitions. War, he said, first is an act of violence to compel our opponents to fulfill our will, I repeat. According to Clausewitz, war is an act of violence to compel force our opponent to fulfill our will. We want our opponent to do what we want him or her to do. And his second definition is even more famous. War is but the mere continuation of policy by other means. If policy or politics depends on the translation, but I think both translations 
are correct because in German politique, you can, it has two meanings. It has the meaning of policy, that is to say policy decisions, policy actions that they undertake, but it also has the meaning of politics, that is to say the, the systemic results of all the policies undertaking, undertaken by the different actors. I repeat, war is the mere, is but the mere, nothing else, in other words, is but the mere continuation of policy or politics by other means. Clausewitz, second definition. The American scholar Quincy Wright, look at the syllabus, at the biography, sorry. Quincy Wright's book, Study of War, written during World War II, the second edition of the 60s. This is how he defines war. War is a violent contact between two distinct but similar entities, a violent contact between two distinct but similar entities. Third definition, had the bull, the boss of the English school, at least of the first generation of the English school in his The Anarchical Society, the book published in 1977, this is how he defines war. War is, I quote, organized violence carried out by political units against each other. Carried out by political units against each other. And last but not least, Colin Gray, a contemporary British strategic thinker in his modern strategy. This is how he defines war. War is organized violence, threatened or waged for political purposes, for political purposes. If then we compare these four definitions, we see that they emphasize three characteristics, which are common to all of them. The presence, first, the presence of armed violence. Second, the presence of political or collective units. At least two. Third, the presence of an objective pursued by the unit launching the violence, resorting to violence. That's, let's have a, a, a detailed look at these three characteristics of war in scientific academic definitions of war. The first characteristic of war, the presence of armed violence. Ladies and gentlemen, there can be no war, strictly speaking, from an academic point of view. Once again, I underline this. There can be no war without armed violence, because otherwise there would be no difference between a war and a conflict. Not every conflict is a war. What is a conflict? A conflict is an interaction between two or more than two actors or units pursuing divergent interests. Looking for, driven, sorry, by divergent aspiration. And therefore, there's a conflict. But this conflict can, and most of the time is, it can be resolved thanks to cooperation, conflict and cooperation. Cooperation presupposes conflict. It, these conflicts, most of the times, are resolved by diplomatic, that is to say, peaceful means. Negotiation, bargain, dialogue. And this is good news, of course. Not any conflict escalates into a war. It is only when one of the protagonists resorts to violence that a war is likely to break up. So a conflict is a war only if, if and only if, and as long as actors resort to violent instruments of conflict resolution rather than uh, preferring peaceful conflict resolution means. This distinction is almost never made by the media, by the politicians themselves, and sometimes not even by students, and sometimes even not 
by academics. In this case, they are not regular. In other words, a conflict is pretty often mistaken with a war. And this is wrong. A conflict almost never, at least very rarely, escalates into a, con a war because precisely it is resolved peacefully. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason why there, there is no such thing as a trade war. There is no such thing as economic warfare. There is economic competition. There is commercial rivalry between China and the US or between Europe and the US. But there is no war. There is no economic war. For the very simple reason that a trade war kills nobody. A trade war does not provoke the death of human beings. Maybe people lose their job. Probably people lose their job. But they are not killed. There is no conscious objective consisting in getting rid physically of other people. So please, use the term economic competition, rivalry, but not economic war, commercial war, trade war. If, or at least as long as you are in the economic setting and as long as you write essays that I will have a look at when I give a mark. The second characteristic, the presence of collective units resorting to armed force, to armed violence. Two points here. The first one, war is a form of political violence that should be distinguished from crime. And this is the reason why it is waged by political collective units and not by individuals. Listen to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his social contract, Le Contrat Social, the French title, original title of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's main book, I quote, war is a relation not between man and man, but between state and state. Individuals are enemies only accidentally, not as men, not even as citizens, but as soldiers, not as members of a country, but as the defenders of their country. War is a relation not between man and man, but between state and state, or between state and the non-state actor, or between two non-state actors. In this case, it's the civil war. We will not deal with that. I told you this already. War is a relation between state and state, or between state and non-state actors. That is to say, between collective units as opposed to individuals. Terrorist networks are collective units made of individuals, sometimes lone wolf terrorists, but they act on behalf of a group of a collective unit. And therefore, the terrorist acts, and of course, the retaliation, the retaliating operations, bombing, targeted killing, drones, etc belong to our domain of war, at least if other conditions are fulfilled, we'll come back to that. Terrorist attacks can be considered to be acts of war from an academic point of view, not from a political one, etc. That's another question. They are acts of war and not crimes. They may be crimes from the criminal law perspective, but not from the political science or international relations discipline perspective. Rousseau's last point, individuals are enemies, not as men, not even as individuals, not, not even as uh, citizens, but as soldiers, as defenders. Individuals, citizens are enemies as defenders. Is that the origin of the second point within the second characteristic of war? Because it refers to the idea that in order for war to exist, there must be reciprocal violence. There must be an attacker and a defender. 
the political unit which is attacked must defend itself by resorting to violence too in order to cope with this attack. In Latin, a war is called bellum. The term belligerent comes from the Latin bellum. And bellum comes from duellum. Duellum, two. Two protagonists struggling, fighting against each other. And Clausewitz, to quote him again, also defines a war as, I quote, nothing but a duel on an extensive scale. A war is a duel on an extensive scale because it is waged by two collective large units. Take the example of World War II. Everybody agrees in saying that it started in September 1940. Why? Because Hitler invaded Poland and Poland tried to defend itself. It did not accept this invasion. Hitler already had attacked Austria in 38. But World War II, nobody considers World War II to start in 1938 because there was no defender. Austria did not try to resist against Hitler's invasion. It accepted, willingly or not, that's not the question, its integration into the Third Reich, the Third Empire of the Nazis of Hitler. And therefore, the war, World War II, the war called World War II, is considered to start on September the 1st, 1939, and not in 1938. Take the example of the second Cold War, the one that the American called the first Cold War, the first Gulf War, Gulf War, sorry, Gulf War. It started in, on August the 2nd, 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We Westerners pretty often consider this war to start on January 18, 1991, when the Americans and their allies launched Operation Desert uh, Storm against Iraq to force him to withdraw. By doing so, we have a, a Western bias, but regarding the academic definition, we committed a confusion, a mistake. The war, which is called the Second Gulf War, started on August the 2nd. Admittedly, Kuwait did not defend itself. Its army is almost non-existing, or at least it's inefficient. But what did Kuwait do? It appealed to the UN Security Council, which amounts to saying that it did not accept the invasion. So it signaled its willingness to defend itself, thanks to the so-called international community, thanks to those states that accepted it to recover it, to recover its sovereignty by uh, forcing. Including by including by violence mean by violent means by forcing Saddam Hussein to withdraw. So two examples of a war needing an attack and a counterattack or defense. A counterexample would be the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. In 1968, the Red Army and the various armies of the Warsaw Pact invaded Czechoslovakia. Because Czechoslovakia at that time, the spring of Prague, tried to reform the then communist regime by introducing some, some liberal elements. So there was violence by the Soviets and its allies of the Warsaw Pact. But it is not a war for the very simple reason that the people of Prague, the people in Czechoslovakia, did not resist by violent means. They were crushed, but they did not resist themselves. They resisted, they did not fight themselves. So it's not a war because there is only one. There is only one state, one unit resorting. The attacker and not the defender. There's only one state, one unit resorting to violence.
The update was true in Hungary, 1956. Once again, a significant part of the Hungarian population wanted to reform, maybe even to get rid of the communist regime. Nagy was the then the leader of this part of the population. Dubček had been the Czechoslovakian leader. The Soviets intervened in 1956. It was Khrushchev, it was Brezhnev in 1968. Khrushchev intervened to crush the rebellion, what he considered to be a rebellion, and the Hungarians tried to resist. So this armed conflict is considered to be a war because there is an attacker, also packed armies, and first and foremost the Red Army, and the defender, those among the Hungarians who did not want to live under a communist regime anymore. Third characteristic of a war, if we come back to the three that all the authors agree upon, war is an activity pursuing a political or rational objective. In other words, war is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. It is fought for an aim beyond the fact of fighting. In other words, to put it differently, it is an instrument of policy within an interaction of two or more than two units, an instrument thanks to which one or various units want to impose their will upon other, one other or other units, hoping thanks to this violence to control the other unit's action, hoping to constrain these other actor or this, the, this other actor or these other actors to constrain him, it or her or, or him or her or them to do what the state initiating the violence wants him or her to do. Which amounts to saying, ladies and gentlemen, that war is a rational undertaking and not an axiom. Almost all international relations scholars, be they theorists or historians, agree upon the fact that I quote Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, in his White House Memories, written after leaving the Secretary of State or after leaving the National Security Council, he was an advisor of Nixon and the Secretary of State of Nixon, and of Ford, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. Listen to Kissinger. Despite popular myths, large military units do not fight by accident. Wars are not the result of accidents. They are rational, we could say, planned undertakings. Blaney, the one I quoted when I said that there are a thousand pages analyzing war and only one analyzing peace. According to Blaney, listen to him, although many have discussed accidental or unintentional wars, although many have discussed accidental or unintentional wars, it is difficult to find a war which fits this description. Wars do not break out accidentally. They are rationally planned by units pursuing a political objective, impose their will upon the opponents. So take the example of China and India. They had recent disputes on the border, the north east of India, the southwest of China. In the case of these limited quarrels escalating into a war, it would be anything but an accident. And you may say, you will say that I am pessimistic, but look at the facts. Look at the fact that almost every state with one or two exceptions, Costa Rica, maybe Iceland, look at the reality, all the states have an army. If you have an army, it is to some extent because you think that you might have to use it one day or another. So you prepare it in order for your army to be fit in the case you need it. This, this comes up, this amounts to saying that yes, wars 
do not break out accidentally. So we have a definition of war as a, a armed violence opposing collective political units pursuing a political objective. Once we have defined war, we can define peace, logically. If then war is characterized by the presence of armed violence between two or more than two collective units pursuing a political objective, then peace means the absence of armed violence between political units. Listen to Raymond Peace exists when war comes to end. And war comes to end when weapons come to a stand still. When weapons shut up, peace prevails. The French original, for those among you who speak French, la guerre ne continue pas quand les armes se taisent. This is a very, a purely, a merely negative definition of peace. But I think it's the only one, which is operational. There are critical definitions of peace. There are normative, ethical, definitions of peace. In the bibliography, I, the first book I mentioned, what is a just peace? The book is full of analyses of what, of people proposing normative or ethical definitions of peace. I would like to go into this it's very quickly. Of the critical definition of peace put forward by the, the Norwegian peace researcher, Johan Galtung. In 1969, he wrote an article, a very famous article called Violence, Peace and Peace Research. He's at the origin of so-called peace research approach, a neo-Marxist critical approach of the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. So he says also, he claims also, he accepts the idea that peace is the absence of violence. But he has a very precise critical definition of violence, a special definition of violence. According to him, violence exists as soon as when human, a human being's actual achievements, what he or she can do, when these actual achievements are inferior to his or her potential achievements. In other words, violence exists when you are prevented from doing what you are able to do when you are prevented from doing what you are able to do by the structural violence in the society that you are living in. And he does associates violence to social injustice. And peace exists when there is social justice, when everybody can achieve what his or her resources, his or her capacities permit him or her to do. So he distinguishes structural violence from physical violence, psychological violence from physical violence, manifest violence from latent violence, personal voluntary violence from non-personal unconscious violence. And therefore, according to him, peace prevails when there is not merely no physical violence, but also when there is no structural violence. The problem with this pretty sympathetic conception, of course, the problem with this conception is that you cannot agree upon what social justice is. There are as many conceptions of what social justice should consist in as there are people thinking about social justice. So you cannot measure social or structural violence, but therefore you cannot measure social peace or social justice synonymous with positive peace. Therefore, I satisfy, ladies and gentlemen, with the merely negative conception of peace. The merely conception of peace, the merely negative conception of peace, peace prevails when no weapons kill people, 
this conception has the advantage to permit to undertake empirical research. We can look at two political units and provide an answer to the question, did they fight the war against each other during this or that period? Did they resort to armed violence or not? We can, at the systemic level, ask the questions, were there more wars in this or that century than in our century? Were there or are there more wars in this or that region than in this or that other? In other words, to define peace negatively by accepting the definition of war that I gave you permits us to undertake comparison and therefore to try to look whether nowadays the world is more peaceful or not than in the past. Of course, in order to do so, we have to add one very important element to the qualitative definition that I gave of war. We have to introduce a quantitative element. We have to give a quantitative definition of war, completely the qualitative one. When is armed violence to which states resort? When is this violence important enough, significant enough, violent enough to be considered as a war rather than a limited dispute? a limited quarrel. Two quantitative levels are likely to be conceived of. We can think of the duration of a conflict. In order for an armed, armed conflict, you see that sometimes I lack rigor too. How long is an armed conflict supposed to last in order to be considered as a war? This could be a quantitative element. Or the second one, how many people are, should be victims of a war, of an armed conflict, in order for this armed conflict to be considered as a war and thus to be taken into account in statistical inquiries. As far as I know, it is the second, indeed, it is the second quantitative element which is taken into account and first and foremost by the famous COW project, C-O-W, Correlates of War project, started when the computer was invented or when the computer started to be used in uh, sciences and, and, and in social sciences in our case, as you say, in the 60s. At the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, at Ann Arbor in the US, the Correlates of War project put forward by two American scholars, David Singer, I put their names and their publications in the bibliography, David Singer and Melvin Small. You can find the data on their website, of course. So according to the Correlates of War project, in order for an armed conflict to be considered as a war, at least 1,000 people must be killed. One thousand people uh, during a time lapse, time span of 12 months. 12 months, not necessarily a civil year, but 12 months continuous from, for example, March 13 year N to March 12 year N plus one. Not necessary from January the 1st to December 31st, okay? There are alternative proposals. The CAR project itself, the group, the research uh, group, the research center at the origin of the CAR project also distinguishes what it calls the MIDs, the Militarized Interstate Disputes, defined as conflicts in which the threat the use and the display of military force short of war is explicitly directed towards another state. So there are militarized interstate disputes when a state says to the other states, 
be careful I might use without using. But it is short of war, it is short of an armed fire. And there is also another threshold of the number of people killed, which is put forward in Scandinavian countries by the Uppsala Conflict Data Project in the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, Sweden and Norway. They consider armed conflicts worth to be taken into account as soon as they kill 25 people. 25 people must die related to the battles, not indirectly killed or indirectly dying of, for instance, pandemics due to wars, which was the case of Spanish flu uh, after 1917, the so-called Spanish flu. So 25 battle deaths. Well, 25 battle deaths is very, very small amount. Therefore, the majority of scholars, the majority of publications, the United Nations too, and the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute's yearbook, which you can find on the internet, at least those data that we need here, they agree in accepting the 1,000 victims threshold in order, within 12 months, in order for an armed conflict to be considered as a war or, to quote the CPRI yearbook, a major armed conflict. This consensus or this quasi consensus is not completely satisfied. There are no reliable statistics regarding, of course, armed conflicts of the past. But maybe there are not even reliable conflicts con uh, concerning contemporary wars. How many people did the French army kill during its operation Barkhane in Mali? in the west, western part of Africa. Nobody knows. We know the French soldiers that died accidentally or killed by the enemy in action. But we do not know how many people the French soldiers do kill. Censorship, of course, exists. We'll come back to this in our second semester course, Democracies at War. The contemporary way to wage wars, the modern warfare, resorts to precise bombings, to smart bombings, to drone warfare. Drones can target one specific individual. In other words, it is possible that nowadays there are less people killed thanks to modern technology. And yet, the, the military operations resulting to drones are particularly very important. The impact, the political impact of the war, are not necessarily correlated to the number of victims. America did comparatively lose not that many soldiers in Vietnam compared to its own civil war, compared to the Vietnamese victims. But the political impact of the Vietnam War upon the US was very, very important. So there are epistemological problems with such a quantitative element. There are methodological problems. Take the example of the India-Pakistan War. It regularly is taken into account in contemporary statistics. That said, or should I say, however, for many years now, since the Kargil War in 1999, those armed disputes that break out at the border, notably in Kashmir, between the two states, only kill less than 10 people, less than 10 soldiers, Indian or Pakistan. And yet, so it's much lower than 1,000. And yet, this war, this conflict is considered as a war, this armed conflict is considered as a war and regularly appears in the statistics. Why? Because it goes back to 1947. And to those wars that ever since 1947, 
provoked the death of tens and hundreds of thousands of Indian and Pakistani victims. And since no peace treaty was signed, a single dispute killing 10 or 20 people nevertheless contributes to those 100,000 people that were killed since the very beginning. In other words, statistical measurements have limits. And this is what the British Prime Minister in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, Benjamin Disraeli said when he said, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, the Americans would say fucking lies, and statistics. Yes, statistics are likely to lie, but what can we reply and what was replied to Benjamin Disraeli? It is easy to lie with statistics, but it is even easier to lie without statistics. So let's use statistics. They can be useful if we know the limit. They are useful, or I should I say, it's not the absolute figures that are useful but it is the relative figures. That is to say, statistics permit to compare. Statistics make comparative studies possible. Comparative studies of the evolution of war and peace over time. In other words, or over time and in the space. So we can ask questions. Were there more wars in the past than nowadays? Do wars more often break out in specific regions than in other regions? So let's have a look at the conclusions drawn by the majority of the various statistical inquiries or the various publications, including statistical data. What is the evolution of war and peace over time? Over the long run, over the long run, that is to say, since the beginning of the contemporary international system, roughly at the end of the 15th century, the very beginning of the 16th century, first, up to World War II, up to World War II. First of all, what we can say is that wars are less frequent nowadays, international ones are less frequent nowadays than in past centuries. Wars do gradually diminish. They are less frequent. There is one important publication which disagrees with this. It is Paul Braumeller's Only the Dead. But he had this definition of uh, wars which is not the one resulting to 1,000 uh, people killed. Anyway, so the frequency of wars is diminishing. Second, Statements, the severity of wars, that is to say, there, the total amount of victims in absolute figures, the total amount of figures is increasing over time. You know that the total wars, the so-called total wars of the 20th century provoked many more deaths than all the other wars throughout the other centuries. So the absolute amount of victims has been climbing throughout the centuries. The severity of wars, the intensity of wars, things are different regarding the intensity of wars. The intensity of wars looks at the number of people as a killed as a percentage of the world population. And obviously, since the world population is growing and growing and quickly growing for some decades now, obviously, as a percentage of the world population, there are nowadays less people killed than in past centuries. But the absolute figures, the absolute amount, the aggregate amount of victims, the severity of war, the, 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 it's the opposite reality. There are more victims in absolute figures. It is also possible for a conclusion to draw to distinguish 
periods of cycles of wars and periods of limited wars internationally. Historians agree in saying that there were, that we can distinguish four periods of cycles of wars, that is to say, involving all or the majority of the major powers of a period of a historical era since the beginning of the international system. The first cycle is the so-called cycle of the wars of the Italian Renaissance, 1494, 1521 opposing notably France and its allies to Spain and its allies in order to control Italy. The second cycle is the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. I mentioned it at the beginning of this course. The third cycle is the cycle of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, 1792. To 1815. And the third, fourth cycle is the cycle of the two world wars, 1914 to 1945. These four cycles are separated by periods of roughly 100 to 150 years of limited wars, no major war involving all the major powers. And the last fact that can be established is that some states are. Um, pretty often involved in wars and other states are never involved in wars. More than 50% of all existing states in whatever historical period, more than 50% never got involved in a war. And during the last five centuries or so, 10 major powers are very, very, very regularly involved in wars. And these 10 units are the 10 major powers which are no longer the same nowadays as they used to be in the past but nevertheless some of them were major powers five years ago and still are some no longer are and some were not in the past but are nowadays so the 10 major powers which launch wars or which join wars that they did not initiate are Spain and Austria because they belong to the same Habsburg family France Great Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and now this Turkey, the United States, Prussia, Germany, one single, I do not go into the details of the historical evolution of the regimes, Russia, which became USSR, which became once again Russia, Italy, Japan, and China. So major powers fight the majority of wars. <laughs> this is important. From 45 to nowadays, the trends go as follows. Two more minutes, ladies and gentlemen, be patient. Since the end of World War II up to nowadays, civil wars are much more important, much more numerous than international wars, but we are not interested in them and we do not know exactly how many there were in the past anyway. What is important for us is that there is an impact upon the wars that are fought. More and more wars since 45 are wars of intervention, of foreign powers into civil wars in countries they are not directly concerned in. This was the case, for instance, of the Americans in Vietnam, for the Soviets in Afghanistan, for the Americans in Afghanistan, for the Americans and the French and the British in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, etc. Et but there are still international wars fought for classical reasons, security, territory, etc. The Korean War, the wars between China and India, the wars between India and Pakistan, the wars between Israel and its Arab neighbors, the Falklands War opposing Great Britain to uh, uh, the Malvinas War, Great Britain to Argentina, the first Persian Gulf War, the war opposing Ethiopia to Eritrea, etc., etc. So there are various trends which are important, which can be uh, seen when we look at when we look for them. But the mere fact to look for them presupposes that we apply theory. Why? Take, and some of them, some, some of you know that, according to realists, there is no change in international part. 
politics, the international politics that's prevailing nowadays is the same as the one analyzed by Thucydides 2,400 years ago. So if no change is possible, there can be no tendency, there can be no trend, there can be no evolution over time. So to claim to some extent that there are less wars than other, than in other centuries, in past centuries, presupposes a somehow non-realist and actually a liberal or constructivist approach. Change is possible. Realists would say, well, okay, nowadays there are less wars than in the past, but we do not know what it is, what will be the case in the future. Maybe there will be as many and maybe there will be even more. We do not know because there is a never-ending state of war. So there are different theories that we will apply, ladies and gentlemen, to analyze the evolution of war. The mainstream theories, I will apply them in the first part, chapters two to six, to analyze the causes of war. And then I will apply them in chapters seven to 11, seven to 11 to analyze, seven to 10, to analyze the possibilities of peace. The first, part mainly will apply realist theories mainly, but not exclusively. The second part mainly will apply liberal theories, and the very last chapter will apply a constructivist approach because constructivism is compatible both with realism and with liberalism. That's the program I do propose to you. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you will be back next week. Have a great day and see you soon. Goodbye.